Um, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the third session in the fish monitoring assessment portion of our webinar series. My name is Jen Bayer and I'll be moderating today's webinar. In case we haven't met, I work for the USGS Northwest Pacific Islands Regional Office, where my duty is to lead the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAP for short. And PNAP, along with our partner project StreamNet program, has co-led the planning of this webinar series. And I would like to really thank the planning group, which has included 13 people from a variety of organizations. This series has um, been going since October <laughs> with talks in October and November, and then January and February. We'll hear more about what's coming up um, for the rest of the series, but count on Thursday afternoons, 1 to 2.30. We have one more fish monitoring assessment topic, and then February will be focused on data management. I'm joined today by one of our planning group members, Marika Dobos from Idaho Department of Fish and Game, who will be introducing our speakers in just a bit. So first off, we have our agenda. Um, we have two speakers and we'll, we'll hear the speak, speakers in, in sequence <laughs> and we'll have a short uh, break for questions following Gabriel Book's presentation. So expect him to speak for about 40 minutes or 30 minutes rather about, about five minutes for questions. Then Ben will come in and give his talk. And at the end, we'll first have a time for questions for Ben, and then we should still have a few minutes at the end to open it up for questions for both speakers. So um, before we get into the speakers though, I wanna give you some <coughs> tips in case you're not familiar with Microsoft Teams yet, um, just so you're comfortable navigating the meeting platform. You can see the toolbar there up on the screen. Um, in Microsoft Teams, the current version, or I should say the new version we have, you'll see this at the top of your screen. Um, I think in some, perhaps a browser version, you see it at the bottom. So look for this. Um, the microphone is how you mute yourself. Please do that if you're not speaking, of course. And if you use your phone to call in, um, please use star six to mute and unmute. Uh, next slide. Other things to know about the platform, um, if you're having problems with the audio, click on the ellipse, the three dots, and go to device settings. Um, sometimes your, your PC or laptop is muted or your headset or something. If you're really stuck, but you can connect to us through the chat, uh, drop a note in there and one of the staff will help you. And we'll be using the, the chat later um, for questions and answers also. And you'll have the option to raise your hand and then we'll call on you. You're raising your hand, we'll will sort of elevate your name in the list of attendees so we can see who's trying to, raise, to ask a question. You could also type your question in the chat and then we'll, we'll read those off. Um, let's see, I think that's all we need to know. Um, so, we're, and just to kind of test those skills and we're gonna uh, be doing a little live polling later in, the, in this webinar, we're gonna ask you to do a little uh, Mentimeter poll just for fun. So uh, we're gonna ask you to navigate to the chat did you see the arrow there? It's a little speech bubble. And there's a link in there to our icebreaker poll. Um, and this is just for fun. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you a second, a few seconds to find your way to that. Click on the link. And then we'll be displaying the results. And if you had trouble finding the chat, you can also go to menti.com and type in the code you see there, 56210074. So I hope you're having a little fun with this. Looks like people are finding the chat. See any uh, dilemmas out there? We see a new species offered in the chat, muskie. Being that I'm from Michigan, I can appreciate that. All right, thanks. Thanks for humoring us with that. It's fun to start out with a, a little light moment and it's also good to have you be comfortable with the meeting platform. So now I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Marika to introduce our speakers. Okay, hey everyone, um, can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through fine. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Marika Dobos. I'm an anatomist staff biologist for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game out of Lewiston. Um, we have two speakers today. Our first speaker is Gabriel Brooks. 
Um, Gabriel Brooks has been slightly more than wader deep in pit tag technology for the past 13 years. Uh, he's leading NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center development efforts on pit tag projects ranging from large scale hydropower detection systems to in-stream antenna applications. And he has developed, helped um, advance pit tag detection systems throughout the Columbia River Basin. So uh, with that, Gabriel Brooks will be pre presenting some of the work he's been involved with. Thank you. I think we have the live poll should be coming up. So just to get uh, a sense of everyone on the call and um, how much you use pit tag, we put together just another live poll. Um, first question is, do you use pit tag? So you should see this in the uh, in the chat window as well, just to, I, I want to see how many people out there actually use this technology. Okay, and there's a follow up question to that. So whether you use this technology or not, I'd like to get uh, sort of the temperature of of if you're using it, what would uh, help expand your use? And if you don't use it, maybe why aren't you using it? So uh, I'm sure you're seeing the questions there, but um, if you can answer those, I'm having a hard time reading them on the screen, but uh, let's see. So limited read range, okay. Remote power requirements, okay. All right, good. That gives me an idea. So with the, the BPA funded R&D project that we've had for a number of years now, we sort of set the focus on what we're going to work on. So this is a good, uh, a good thing for me to capture and, and see why people uh, either would use them more if they had a better read range or when they would start using them with the read range. So with that, I'm going to move into my presentation. Uh, first, thank you all for um, joining us today. Let me share. And just real quick, are you seeing my presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Yep. I can see it. Perfect. Thank you. OK, again, welcome. My name is Gabriel Brooks. I work for NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service out of the Seattle office. Um, and for those of you who don't use pit tags, I'm going to give you just a very quick explanation uh, in case you're unfamiliar with the technology, how pit tags work. So you can see the image there on the right with the three pit tags uh, uh, referenced to the size of a penny. The top one is a 23 millimeter half duplex tag. The center one is a 12 millimeter tag, a full duplex tag, which is the most common tag we use in the Columbia Basin. And below that is the nine millimeter full duplex tag. So these tags can be this small because they don't have an internal battery. Uh, they harvest energy from an antenna that's, that's in the stream. So as the tag passes over that antenna, it acts like a loosely coupled transformer and it takes energy from the electromagnet electromagnetic field of the antenna, and that powers it up and it's able to respond with its tag code. And you can see in that picture uh, the tag location in a juvenile fish. When I say we use pit tags in the Columbia Basin, we actually use quite a bit of pit tags in the Columbia Basin. So um, over the last decade, we've averaged about 2 million pit tags uh, per year with the exception of 2020. Um, and these are the pit tags that are uh, from BPA projects. There's there's a lot more than that, but um, BPA projects we're using about 2 million a year. That's a lot of pit tags. Uh, this is a map of all of the pit tag detection sites that are registered in Pitagas. Uh, almost 300 sites throughout the Columbia River Basin to detect those tagged fish. There are a lot more sites than this that aren't registered sites, but this gives you an idea of the breadth of pit tag detection through the Columbia Basin. And when I say pit tag sites, um, this is what people typically think of as an in-stream pit tag site. So these are the top two pictures passed by antennas that are anchored to the stream bottom. And as the tagged fish passes over top of it, it'll be detected. And those read ranges from those antennas can be anywhere from a max of 12 inches to 30 to 36 inches above the antenna to detect that tag. Um, that works well unless you have a, a large pulse of water that's higher than 36 inches and then you can miss fish that are passing over top of them. 
which is why an application like the pass-through antenna that you see there in the bottom is sometimes preferential because you're passing all of the water through it. It's the best way to couple energy from the antenna into the tag. Uh, so if you can get away with doing that, uh, that's the best way to install a pit tag site. Uh, that said, anyone looking at that that's familiar with streams can understand that that's oftentimes very difficult. So what I'm going to talk about next is the flexible antenna cable that we've developed and how that has potential applications for in-stream sites like that. So the development of this flexible cable started back in uh, 2012. We have a pile dike system uh, installed in the lower Columbia. So pile dikes, there's a series of them in the lower Columbia, and they were installed to uh, keep sediment out of the shipping channel, but they also work quite well for focusing fish around to the end. So both upstream and downstream migrating fish, uh, when they encounter the pile dike structure, they'll move out towards the thaw wagon pass around. It. So we installed this uh, to look at upstream uh, adult migration in 2012, and it is essentially an in-stream site. At the time we used six four foot by 10 foot antennas, two of them mounted to the pile dike structure, and then four of them in an array at the end of the pile dike. Uh, we started to notice in the data that uh, there were more fish that were detected on the antenna five and six than were detected passing through the array of antennas at the end. And we confirmed this with some Ditson data uh, that showed adults would come up, they would come to the end, they would sense that constriction of the antennas, they would do a few loops and they'd swim out and around the wing wall. So about that time in 2012, Biomark introduced the IS-1001 reader, which is uh, twice as powerful as its predecessor, the multiplexer. I got a call from the group down there and asked, well, how big of an antenna can we drive with this new reader? So I pulled together a pretty quick uh, 10 foot by 10 foot antenna and was surprised that we were reading 40 inches out in front of it, even with an antenna of that size. So the group down there uh, put together a prototype and submerged it in water. And even with just a one inch air gap, uh, they were able to get detections on a 10 foot antenna. So we came away from that and decided we were gonna test everything that would influence the, the antenna readability. So we performed a series of over a hundred tests at our Pasco field station, where we looked at wire size and type, um, the proximity of the, the wire inside there uh, to each other. Um, the layout, either a flat layout or a triangular layout, and then insulation properties of the wire itself. A couple of key findings from those tests were that the insulation of the wire actually um, had a, a, an impact. Now, we saw a 5% uh, increase in antenna current when we went from PVC insulated wire to FEP insulated wire. Um, and PVC is the most common wire if you just buy off the shelf wire, but the FEP uh, insulation uh, has a lower dielectric constant, so you're not spending energy polarizing the insulation, you're actually building the field. Uh, the other thing was wire separation. We found that even just a little bit of separation in those windings could increase the uh, read range up to 8%. So uh, we took that away, we built another prototype where we glued uh, backer rod foam insulation together and we put Litz wire that was FEP jacketed wrapped all of it in cellophane and put it in a three quarter inch uh, conduit, flexible conduit, and that worked quite well. We were able to build antennas that were 20 feet by eight feet and still have read range all the way through the center of it. So uh, we took all the knowledge from that testing and our prototypes, and I designed a cable that you see there on the right that has very low dielectric constant of everything inside there uh, that foam insulation that's in there and the insulation on the wire, and it uses Litz wire as well. Uh, with that, we've been able to construct a large 12 antenna system uh, that we tow up the Columbia River. Uh, each antenna has an IS-1001 located on it, and, um, and we tow that up the river with two uh, small skiffs. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2017. The first year we deployed this, uh, we had uh, at some points a six antenna system and at some points a 12 antenna system, but in 62 hours of concurrent sampling with the matrix trawl, which is our historic data collection platform in the lower Columbia, we had 16% of the detection. So for every hundred fish we picked up on the matrix trawl, we picked up 16 on the flexible array. In 2018, we went to all manufactured cable antennas and all 12 antennas. Um, we also, at that point, settled on some settings in the master controller. 
And uh, there was one firmware issue that that uh, had gone unnoticed because uh, no one was doing basically what we were doing. Uh, once all of that was fixed, we were at about 44% of the matrix trawl detections. In 2019, we replaced the CAN bus cable. Uh, the CAN bus cable that had been used on the flexible system was old at that point and was not being used as it was intended to be used. Uh, so we took that opportunity to redesign a more robust cable for that system. And that year we detected 66% uh, in 215 hours of concurrent sampling. Uh, keep in mind that the matrix trawl is sampling 300 feet of river, uh, whereas the flex is only about 85 to 90 feet. Uh, and we're detecting two thirds of the fish. So going forward, uh, we're gonna make some improvements on the flexible system. Uh, currently we hand deploy this. Uh, we'd like to move to uh, net reel deployment and retrieval. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to upgrade the enclosures that the IS-1001s are, are located in. Uh, and we intend to do those upgrades this next season. Whoops, skip the slide. So one of the other things we deal with and you will deal with if you use flexible cable in an in-stream application is what's called vortex-induced vibration. So anytime you have a cylinder in a medium that's passing uh, past it, you'll create these vortices behind it. And if it's not rigid, like a flexible cable, it has a tendency to uh, hum a bit in the water. And what that does is the antenna is constantly changing shape. So the reader is having to compensate for that change in shape and constantly retuning. Uh, the way to overcome this is to fare the cable. So the top left picture there is a manufactured fare cable, fared cable, and the uh, the picture on the bottom right is an aftermarket fairing that we've purchased to install on the flexible system for this year. Um, another uh, avenue to increase detections is to increase the size of this flexible array. So we're working with a company in Seattle to develop flexible trawl doors that will act as kites when we put this in the water and just simply pull the whole array uh, wider. So I, I told you all of that to tell you this, with this flexible cable, it has applications for in-stream uh, pit tag detection. You can see uh, Weenus Creek and then Gold Creek on the bottom right there. Those are two sites that have been uh, designed and installed by the Yakima Nation, um, where they're passing the entire stream through one antenna, or in the case of Weenus Creek, three uh, antennas. Um, when you pass all the water through there, if you can have an antenna that's taller than the water, then you're almost guaranteed to get all of the detections. Um, that Gold Creek antenna is 87 feet wide by seven feet tall and has 100% detection all the way across it. So I think this has uh, potential to increase juvenile detections at any stream that can accommodate a pass-through antenna. Um, uh, one caveat to this is if you have a system that has uh, a high, uh, a lot of pit tags in it, um, you may have tag collision where if you have two tags uh, entering the antenna field at the same time, you may not be able to detect either one of them. Um, we are working on a site uh, currently in Steigerwald, which is in Washuga, Washington, uh, where we are designing the site with uh, West Fork Environmental and the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership, where we're building an antenna that will be 84 feet wide and seven and a half feet tall. We've already built the prototype and tested it. And again, it was 100% reads all the way through the center of it. And these antennas are driven by a single IS-1001 reader. Some other places where we're using this cable, because it's designed to be in the water and operate without an air gap, um, we're replacing, as they fail, replacing the Bonneville slot antennas. Uh, previously, these antennas had the windings inside of them and they were fully potted, but that potting is like 4,000 pounds. Over, over time, it would settle to the bottom and open up the enclosure and as water intruded, it would cause the antenna to fail. So we're replacing those antennas with this flexible cable. So that is all I have on the flexible cable. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about the Columbia class pit barge that we've been using in the lower Columbia for the last three years. We started this back in 2018, uh, West Fork Environmental uh, leased a barge to us. Uh, and we really that year, we wanted to see how difficult it would be to install it. Um, what it would take to anchor this system and how well it would stay on anchor, whether we could keep pinnipeds off of it, because there are a lot of them down there, and 
get an idea of the basic operations and maintenance for a site like this. Now you can see in that uh, upper right picture, uh, it, it stayed on station once we installed it, it didn't move very much, which would allow us to put it pretty close to the shipping channel in the future. Uh, the antennas on this barge for this year were only six feet deep. In 2019, uh, we wanted to put bigger fins on it and, and reach 12 feet down into the water and move it someplace that had higher velocity water. And in order to do that, um, if the velocity was high enough where we couldn't safely access the barge, we needed it to be mostly autonomous for the season. So Westfork developed a system that would uh, raise the fins and lower the fins every 12 hours to shed debris underneath it. Um, we did get this in pretty late in the season. If you recall in 2019, there was a federal shutdown and that backed up our contracting. So we got it in pretty late, but we were able to test it. It did shed debris. Um, we had some issues with it wandering from side to side. You can see in that top left picture, the fins are actually pretty far forward on the barge. Uh, so we had uh, some lessons learned from that year. In 2020, uh, this last year, we did a full deployment for the entire season. We wanted to put it in even higher velocity water, modified the barge by adding um, some area to the front of it, which is essentially moving the fins back, um, and we sampled for the entire season. So this slide shows some data from this last season. The top left graph in red are the pit tag detections on the barge and the orange is the flow at Cascade Island. So you can see even when the Columbia River exceeded 400,000 CFS, we were still detecting fish. So we saw about 11 feet per second on the barge. The water was going pretty fast through there. Um, the top right graph are the detections in blue on the barge uh, relative to the Bonneville Corner Collector in the orange. And then below that, uh, B2J is in orange. And that just gives you a sense that uh, we were detecting fish as, as the, the pulses of fish in the river increased, we were seeing that on the barge. I'm gonna back up to this previous slide for a second. Notice the mooring ball that's out in front of the barge. Um, because the water velocity got so high this year, there was quite a bit of disturbance around that, that mooring ball. And we think we were seeing some avoidance issues due to that. So the, the center graph where we have 847 detections on the Washington side and 671 on the Oregon side and 390 in the center, that's uh, counter to what we've seen in previous installations where on the Walla Walla and the Yakima River, most of the fish were detected in the center. So um, we think that that mooring ball may have impacted that. Um, over the course of the 2020 season, we saw 625 unique detections. Uh, and we can simply expand that without improving the barge, we should see about 1,250 on a full-size barge. This is still a half-size prototype barge. Uh, to put that in perspective, our trawl gets a little over 11,000 mean detections annually over the last three sample seasons. So other applications for the barge, uh, we have the potential because we've proven it can, it can be uh, pretty much autonomous for the entire season. Uh, placement in the forebay of a main stem dam to look at uh, powerhouse uh, utilization or in some place where you're trying to look at cold water refugia. Uh, we have kicked around these ideas for using the barge in the future as well. One other project that we've worked on uh, in the uh, under the umbrella of the R&D project uh, is a new multiplexer system. So we're working with Biomark. Uh, we've contracted to develop a new system to replace uh, the old uh, FS-1001 multiplexer. So uh, it will use the IS-1001, uh, the reader board that's currently used, but instead of using a single reader per antenna, uh, this will allow us to multiplex through six antennas, just like uh, the old MUX. And this should address the concerns about lowering the, the entry point as far as cost on installing pit tech systems. It won't work as well as the IS-1001 that was designed uh, to have the greatest read range. And the best way to do that is keep the electronics at the antenna itself. Um, but this will give the benefit to the sites that are still operating a MUX uh, and they're comfortable with the read range of that old multiplexer. Additionally, it will add half duplex detection to the system and the potential to detect fast tags in the future. Um, 
It's also designed around the low inductance antennas that the IS-1001 currently operates on. Um, one other concern that some people have uh, brought to our attention is the daisy chain approach for the IS-1001. If you're familiar with the system, you have one master controller uh, that's connected to each antenna in a string uh, through a daisy chain. And if something were to happen to that single CAN bus cable that's feeding power and data to those antennas, uh, you can lose multiple antennas, whereas uh, this system is designed in the star topology where there'll be one cable feeding each antenna. Um, we're hoping to have this completed uh, next summer, summer of 2022. And then the thing that has uh, occupied most of our time and, and funding over the last couple of years has been the Lower Granite Project. Um, so this is uh, sort of the holy grail of, of in-stream pit tag detection. I mean, you, you saw in the one of the first slides there, we have a lot of in-stream detectors out there. Um, but once they enter the main Columbia River, it's really hard to get detections. I mean, we do have juvenile bypass facilities at, at these dams, but as we spill more and more water, we're going to miss more and more of those fish. So uh, really, we've been trying to do a spillway detector for many years. For those of you unfamiliar with Lower Granite Dam, it is uh, the first dam that fish will encounter when they exit the Snake River Basin. So this project really started back in 2006 at Bonneville. The idea was to add detectors, uh, add antennas to the bottom of the gates. Um, we worked on this project, had some prototypes, uh, worked with Destron Fearing. Um, we learned a lot, but it, it never ended up going forward. A lot of things happened at that time and the, the technology just really wasn't there. Uh, but we learned about Litz wire and ferrite tiles in order to get closer to, uh, to ferrous metals. So moving from there, we did our first uh, idea of detection at Lower Granite Dam. Uh, you can see the picture in the left. It was a series of antennas that all acted as one. Uh, we built prototypes. We built uh, Biomark built prototypes and we did read range testing and the antennas detected up to over 50 inches above them. So we had the detections we needed. Um, the uh, the showstopper was the fact that in order to install these at Lower Granite, the Army Corps of Engineers would have been required to cut a 50 foot wide notch that was six feet front to back and seven feet deep. They would have had to cut two of those in their perfectly good spill bay. So as you can imagine, they got cold feet on that project. So moving from there in the last couple of years, uh, the Corps decided that they were going to uh, reshape spill bay one at Lower Granite. And that provided us the opportunity if we could develop antennas that would fit into the design criteria of being no taller than 12 inches and could be covered with uh, six to seven inches of concrete and operate and detect fish at the water velocities projected, then we, they would give us a 27 foot exclusion zone where we could install these antennas and shields and they wouldn't put uh, ferrous metal, either rebar or bolts or anything else in that area. So we came up with an antenna design, uh, a layout that balanced the cost of the infrastructure with uh, the redundant detections that we would need in a high velocity environment like a spill bay. So uh, there are 11 antennas that were designed in. You can see that very center antenna is actually split in half. Um, there's a expansion joint that runs right down the middle of the spill bay. So we had to uh, make essentially two parts to one antenna. So uh, Biomark set about designing a prototype uh, antenna. You can see it pictures on the right there, which is a, a, a very clever and novel design, one that's uh, never been seen before, but operates exceedingly well. You can see um, the read ranges on the left-hand side. It provides a very uniform rectangular read field that is just big enough to capture a full telegram detection as a fish goes through at 75 feet per second. So you need about a little over 28 inches at that speed to recover the entire telegram. And these antennas were designed for that, uh, for that water velocity. The bottom right picture, you can see a prototype antenna in one of the aluminum shield bodies. So, <clears throat> pardon me, the antenna was done. We had a fair bit more testing to do uh, to proof the system out, one of which being the concrete. Uh, we haven't embedded antennas in concrete before, so uh, we needed to test that. Uh, initially in the contract, it was not, we scoped out non-magnetic aggregate, uh, which was used at the Bonneville Corner Collector. 
Um, the Army Corps of Engineers had some reservations about using an untested aggregate on a spill bay that sees you know, logs and, and boulders and such. So they asked us to do a comparison test between the non-magnetic aggregate and the standard aggregate. We did that and confirmed that the standard aggregate was perfectly fine for this application. Additionally, because these are the most powerful RFID readers in the world, uh, we had to make sure that the proximity of the antennas, because they're all on all the time, uh, we could get them and the shields to operate in close proximity. So we had to do some synchronization testing. Uh, we had to test uh, pit tags at high velocities over top of these antennas, uh, which we did and, and succeeded at. We took it one step further and we entombed one of our prototype antennas in the concrete mix that would be used at Lower Granite Dam. You can see that in the bottom right picture, that's in a fish way at, at Pasco. That was to do a long-term burn-in on one of our FS3001s, give us a platform for troubleshooting in the future, and to take a look at, at concrete curing and how that would affect the tune of these antennas and transceivers after installation. Because all of this is, is really the first time any of it's been done. So last winter, we started the installation. Um, you can see that picture on the top left. Uh, those antennas are placed at a 45 degree angle uh, on the spill bay there, spill bay one. Uh, and that is what you see exposed that 27 foot of uh, exclusion zone where everything inside there uh, was either fiberglass for the rebar or stainless steel uh, with the exception of the aluminum shields. Um, everything was put in place, the concrete was poured. You can see the bottom left there, that's after the concrete pour. And you can see the outline of the capacitor boxes that allows access into the uh, junction with the exciter cables and the capacitors, which were the component that may fail over time. And we wanted to make sure that we could still access those and replace them if necessary. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, the buildings that were installed, the top houses, the data collect collection platform and the bottom building is the transceiver building that has all of the 11 transceivers that operate. So this is inside that transceiver room. You can see all 11 uh, transceivers on the wall. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, exposed view of the FS3001 transceiver. Again, this is the most powerful RFID, a low frequency RFID uh, reader in the world. Um, Biomark took great care to uh, designed this system to limit uh, internal interference. So they broke apart, apart all of the components of it, the CPU module and the exciter, and separated everything to shield it so that we could have a sensitive system to detect as high as we could uh, for those tags passing over. So after the installation, we needed to uh, do some testing to see what sort of read range we would get. We struck a line across the center of each one of those rows of antennas, and then one 15 inches upstream and 15 inches downstream, and that would give us that 30 inches that we need at 75 feet per second. We took uh, measurements every foot across all of those lines, and we took the lowest point on that, and that determined what the maximum read range uh, for that antenna or antenna row would be. And with that, we developed these graphs to show that uh, with the 24 inches of laminar flow that, that was projected for this spill bay, uh, with the 12 millimeter tag, not only would we have 100% detection, uh, but we would have mostly duplicate and triplicate detection of those tags as they pass down the spill bay. Um, looking at the nine millimeter tags, we're probably at about 60% of tags that would go down the spill bay. Um, so this was the day that we opened the spill bay for the first time. And this is the 24 inches of, of laminar water. Okay, so it's not exactly laminar, but it's probably pretty close to 24 inches at the points it's crossing the antennas. Uh, those two rooster tails that you see on either side, that's an artifact of the removable spillway weir that's up in front of the spillway, uh, not sealing to the side or not being sealed to the sides. Um, on that first, uh, few days that we opened this up, we did some stick tests. So we put pit tags inside of sticks and dropped them into the spill bay. And this confirmed that water velocity, looking at the detections, uh, we calculated we were, we were just about 78 feet per second of water velocity, which is great. And we had designed in a little bit of buffer on those antennas. Um, and we were able to detect uh, tags that were moving down in, in the water column. Um, so we're not completely finished with lower granite. 
Um, there are a few future upgrades that we're looking at. Uh, we're going to improve the the uh, synchronization methodology. Uh, nothing's gone wrong with it yet, but just looking forward again to, to make it more robust, we're going to improve uh, how the, the system is synchronized. The one thing we can't control remotely uh, is the exciter voltage, which determines the power of each one of those antennas. So we're working with Biomark on a system that will allow us to uh, remotely control the exciters. Over the course of this first season, really the only maintenance issue that uh, we came across is due to the excessive vibration of the deck where those buildings sit, we had some of the conduits come loose underneath that bottom um, building. Uh, so we've uh, determined we need a permanent fix for that. And then we intend to do a live fish evaluation uh, uh, where we'll release uh, fish into the, the spillway and get it a good estimate of what the detection uh, probability is for a lower granite. So with that, um, I'll open it to questions, but I, I want to preface that with um, I'm always available. I mean, I'm a part of my contract uh, with BPA uh, is support for pit tags in the basin. So even if you don't have a question right now, um, if you uh, ever feel the need to talk about pit tags, certainly give me a call and uh, let me know I'm available. So with that, uh, anybody have any questions? I see a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Gabe, I don't know if you had a chance to see those. The first one was about uh, percentage of fish that were tagged. Or did you detection of? Uh, I'm just going to read it. Sorry, from Mark McKinstry. Sorry, Mark. You picked up 16% of matrix trawl fish, but what percentage of fish were tagged? All of them? Is asking. Oh, so so those detections, Mark. That's everything that's been released up above. I mean, they have the matrix trawl in the system. Uh, because you always need a lower site to look at at what you're detecting at the the next site up above. So that's what we use the matrix trawl for. We don't tag any fish for that project. It's simply detecting all the fish that's been tagged in the entire Columbia Basin that are that's passing by. And those detections were just on the days we sampled, we had the matrix trawl out and the flexible array sampling in the river at the same time, not necessarily in the same place, but they were out on the river at the same time. So there should have been roughly the same. Um, amount of fish in the river. Hopefully that answered the question. Thanks, Gabriel. And I'll remind folks, you can raise your hand and speak for yourself so I don't butcher your question, or you could type your question into the chat. And Mark had a follow-up question about cost, but I see that um, Steve has responded to uh, how to get more information about cost for the cable. Any other questions for Gabe? And we will have time at the end. Ken Fecho. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Ken. Hi, Gabriel. A great presentation. Uh, and thanks for going over through a lot of the electronic sort of phenomena that affects these um, readings. Um, one of the things that I have seen in, in the smaller systems where there is pass-throughs is um, keeping them in during storm events or runoff events. And it seems like uh, projects that I'm familiar with are constantly repairing these tag arrays. And just didn't know if you're finding success in anything that you're working in and you know, more, you know, um, gravel bottom streams, if you will, or cobble bottom streams that are having success keeping tag arrays in during um, higher flow events, even though I understand there's some limitations, but anything, try to keep those in uh, detecting longer. Um, it, that is definitely a struggle with any site. I mean, flexible antennas are, um, you're probably uh, familiar with the, just the, the standard pass over in-stream antennas. I mean, it really depends on the, the river itself. I mean, we use uh, manta ray earth anchors and then strap them in, and we've done that with flexible antennas as well. Uh, I've worked with a colleague at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center where we're not anchoring them at all in the stream, um, where we have them uh, tied off on either side with one carabiner on the far side, so they'll just break away and that we can put it back um, when the flow goes down a bit. Uh, so it is difficult, but it for the flexible systems, it's no more or less difficult than doing it with a standard PVC pipe antenna or HDPE pipe antenna. In fact, it may be a little bit easier because you can match the bottom contour better. 
Thank you. You're welcome. I see uh, I another know. question. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I see a question in the chat from Steve. He's asking, has the reason, region had an opportunity to, <laughs> to utilize detections at the OGE? Um, that is going to be part of Ben's talk next. So sit tight. He will explain <laughs> everything that we've done with the massive amount of data we've collected from that system. Good lead in. Thank you. Any other questions? I see a note from, let's see, at the end, another question. At the end of the presentation, you mentioned vibration. Is the cable vibration bad enough to look at new dampening slash material slash fastening strategies? Um, so at the end of the presentation, the vibration that I referenced is the vibration at lower granite just due to spill. Um, you can feel it in the ground when you're standing there. Um, so that vibration uh, miraculously hasn't affected uh, the system performance at all. The only thing that's happened at lower granite is underneath the bottom building, there are some six by six uh, pull boxes on that stainless steel conduit. And the vibration has just caused them to loosen up a little bit because we're throwing so much power in the exciter cables that are feeding those antennas. It throws some energy onto that grounded conduit. And if there's a little gap in there that's constantly opening and closing, we see that uh, the result is noise. So, and we know this because when I was there testing, I could stand on the floor and it would get quiet and I would back up and it would get noisy. So we crawled under there and tightened those up. And then Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, who does the operations and maintenance at Lower Granite, uh, they had to tighten those a couple times over the season. So that was the vibration I talked about uh, at the end. The cable vibration um, from the flexible cable, there's really, I mean, short of making it a rigid frame uh, for those cable antennas uh, for the flex, uh, which we, we can't really do for deployment uh, reasons, the best way would be to add that fairing to cut down on the vortices produced behind the cable and just keep the whole thing from vibrating. But even with that vibration, we're detecting twice as many fish as the matrix trawl. We're just not sampling as much area. Thanks, Gabriel. I think we're going to have one more question, and then we're going to shift gears and hear from Ben Sanford. But the last question, and again, we'll have question time at the end, from Polly Gibson. She asks, related to the previous question about flexible antenna arrays during storm events, have you had problems with beavers chewing on flexible antenna in-stream arrays? Um, I have not. And so the the... So we haven't, there's not a lot of those out there yet. I mean, I, I really think uh, they have the potential uh, to add a lot of detection, especially if you're targeting juveniles. Um, but the Yakima Nation stuff is uh, up in Washington and I haven't heard anything about beavers um, chewing through those. I mean, I'm sure if you put one of those down on the John Day, you could probably uh, certainly test that theory. Um, but I haven't heard of that. But it, it's certainly an issue. I mean, they chewed through exciter cables before I know that in some of the John Day uh, sites. All right. Well, that sounds like something to keep an eye on in the future. I'm going to turn it back to Marika so she can introduce Ben. Thank you so much, Gabriel, and more questions to come later. Thanks, Gabriel. Great talk. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. He's Ben Sanford from NOAA Fisheries as well. He is a mathematical statistician. Uh, he got his, math, his uh, BS at Central Washington University and his master's in statistics from Oregon State University in 1988. And since then has been uh, working with NOAA Fisheries for the past 32 years. So Ben provides statistical support for a number of projects, including juvenile survival studies, Idaho wild Chinook salmon migration studies, fall Chinook salmon at Lower Granite Dam and estuary pit, pit tag trawl and various other pit tag summaries. He provides help with experimental design, sample sizes, summary of data from large databases and conducts st statistical tests on results. So um, with that, Ben will be presenting um, some of the work he's been involved with recently. Okay, well, if you can hear me, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Yes, we can hear you, Ben. <laughs> and can you see the screen? 
Yes, looks great. All right, good. Well, uh, thanks so much to Gabriel uh, for that. Uh, I've heard this multiple times, but for that really nice talk about all the developments that have been happening uh, in pit tag technology in the Columbia Basin that he's been largely uh, involved in or responsible for. And I'm just going to talk about the, the data gathered from those developments and just some a few examples. I'd like to, to of course, acknowledge um, all the folks that have been involved in the, the data ac acquisition and the development of these pit tag systems. Um, starting especially with those that I share, well, before COVID anyway, I shared an office with in Pasco. Um, also the folks down at Point Adams, uh, a couple statisticians of in Seattle, and then of course staff for many, many agencies. I'm just gonna focus on four examples uh, of the things that Gabriel has already talked about. Hopefully I can gloss over uh, details since he uh, gave you quite a nice description of of all the uh, systems plus all, a lot of the acronyms and, and locations of things. First of all, uh, the, the pit barge, um, it has been operational three years, <coughs> but I'm just going to talk about in 2020, and there were 625 fish is all. That's a small number compared to how many pit tags are out there we know, but there were only 625 fish detected there. Uh, so it's kind of still a, a proof of concept and we need uh, better locations, multiple barges, that sort of thing. But the nice thing is that we did see in those fish, uh, we saw detections all across the season, especially lump in May. We saw across all species, uh, primarily with Chinook and Steelhead. Um, but there was, a, there was a lot of data represented in those 625. Um, we use that information um, as we do with the pit trawl um, and flexible antennas to uh, look at fish that we know have passed Bonneville Dam so that we can estimate detection rates to Bonneville Dam so we can estimate survival from wherever fish are released down to there, to Bonneville. And so in the top right uh, little table there is showing that that, uh, for example, Chinook, there were 390 fish seen on the on the pit barge. 59 of those have been seen previously at Bonneville. And so that gives us a detection rate of about 15%. And that varied among species. But uh, I just wanted to throw one little example up to show you what we can do with this. Um, there was a, a hatchery uh, release of Chinook in the uh, way up in the upper Columbia. They were seen at Bonneville and at the pit barge. And only two of them happened to be seen at both places. And so if we use that very small number to construct this detection efficiency, we end up with a survival estimate of like 98%, which is not reasonable. And that's because of a small sample size problem. However, if we use the 15% that uh, we found for all Chinook, we get an estimate around 37%, which is much more reasonable. So in the future, especially if we increase detections, um, we're going to be able to um, estimate survival for all kinds of groups with this kind of technology. The best thing I thought about this uh, data set this year was, again, we only had 625 total detections. That seems like not very many. However, those 625 came from all over the Columbia Basin. Uh, we fish are released all in many many places around the basin, and we saw uh, them pass through this detector down at the you can see on the left side down there by Portland below Bonneville. Uh, that's where the detector was, and uh, so if we uh, increase the numbers, we're going to start seeing lots of fish from lots of places, and that's really the kind of data we want to see going forward. The flexible antenna that uh, Gabriel described um, is, has many applications. I'm going to talk about its, its um, application as hopefully a way to replace the pit trawl, which has been a, you know, a mainstay pit tag detection below Bonneville for decades now. Um, and so here's the deployment of that um, flexible array. And in 2019, uh, we did a side-by-side 
kind of uh, comparison. I mean, they were fishing in the, in the river at the same time on many days throughout the season. And if we look at, in these graphs, the proportion of all detections that were seen on the flexible antenna, then if it's as effective as the pit trawl in numerically, then that would be about 50%, which is what those blue lines are. And so you see that for Chinook and Coho and Sockeye, we, we might be getting there. Uh, steelhead, we seem to have a real problem getting as many steelhead, and that needs to be looked into. Uh, they're larger and, and uh, may be able to avoid uh, this uh, detector better or more than they do the, the, the paratrol, so that needs to be looked into. We can further break this down um, here. This is for Chinook. Um, we can look at other variables that might affect uh, the proportion that this flexible antenna uh, detects compared to the paratrol. Um, two that we really noted here are the tide change per hour. Sometimes when you're fishing, the tide's going out, sometimes coming in, and that is an effect at the head of the estuary here where these are fishing. Um, also flow, um, we have definite changes through time. We know that the paratrol, for example, detects less fish when the flow is high. And it, it looks like with the combination of those two, which is the box plot in the bottom there, um, when, when the flow is higher and the tide is going out, the flexible antenna seems to do better. Um, now, how we use all this and what further developments we get, I don't, I'm not sure of, of course, but uh, we are hoping to use this new technology to replace the older, more expensive te technology. Third example I want to talk about uh, are these uh, in-stream arrays. Now, there, as Gabriel said, there's many of them all over the Columbia Basin. Um, there are a bunch up in Idaho in the Snake and Salmon. And NOAA, PASCO folks and others, um, we pit tag Chinook Par in 16 Idaho streams annually for uh, 30 some years. Uh, some of those uh, streams have in-stream arrays that are downstream of where we release our fish. Here's an example in this picture of uh, Lower Big Creek where we're tagging fish at Taylor Ranch. And I should have asked Gabriel, I, I can't remember exactly where the antenna is, but it, that red line is an idea. It's, it's in this general area that's right where we're tagging fish. And then we release the fish upstream a bit, but not that far. So we have uh, several streams that have in-stream arrays below the places that we release fish. And so we can estimate survival from release to the in-stream array. And then from, that's the blue circles here. And then from the in-stream arrays down to lower granite, that's the orange squares, uh, with the composite being those uh, gray diamond uh, triangles. And it looks like for 2020 in general, um, the survival component of the overall survival, the survival component above the detectors and below the detectors is roughly similar. And that's information that's very useful. We can also look at um, survival by season uh, as the fish migrate past these in-stream arrays uh, in the fall, the winter, or the spring, we can then reset those the overall release group into components for those three seasons and estimate survival uh, to lower granite um, and through the fall, the winter, the spring, as noted here. Now, this graph is kind of chaotic a little bit because, as you see on the table on the, on the left there, the sample sizes of fish that are both seen at in-stream arrays and then also detected at lower granite the next uh, spring are pretty small given the numbers of fish we are, uh, tag. And so if we could have larger sample sizes, we might see the kinds of patterns we'd expect and start to estimate things like overwintering survival and where fish are. These arrays also give us uh, information about migration through time. Uh, on the left here is Valley Creek where we release fish in July. 
of each year, and then those fish pass the Valley Creek detectors all the way into April and May of the migration season. On the right, we have uh, lower Big Creek and upper Big Creek. We release fish way up in the stream and down lower, and the lower ones, of course, being released near the in-stream array, like the picture I showed, do tend to go past it earlier. It's kind of logical. The ones released in upper Big Creek um, travel down and spread out much more over time. We have a, a new array that's, that started up in October of 2019 uh, in Marsh Creek. And we have two releases above that at Marsh Creek and Cape Horn Creek. And so um, just immediately after this detector was installed, we started seeing detections and a good number of them. And so we're looking forward to future data when this detector may uh, really give us a lot of information. Um, some of the information, you get this from all of these arrays, is that you can look at when the fish migrate out and the tagging length, or the length they were when they were tagged. And we get this general uh, pattern where uh, larger fish tend to come out a little bit later. And finally, since this is the, the big hurrah, I want to focus on the uh, GRS detector at Laura Granite. And uh, Gabriel gave an extremely detailed description of how that works. So hopefully I can uh, use that here very, very well. Uh, on the left, the, the uh, first table is talks about the proportion of antennas that, have, that tags are detected on. Tags tend to be detected, well, tend to, almost all are only detected a single time on each antenna. But as you can see here, about two thirds of the fish that are detected are detected on two or three detectors. So that gives us a lot of confidence in the data that even though these fish are moving through very rapidly and with very quick detections on a single detector, we're probably seeing what we're seeing and that, that it's uh, authentic, uh, not a lot of false positives, that sort of thing. The middle uh, table is just kind of an indication in with the green, darker green being bigger proportions that as fish come through the um, detector, well, through, through the spillway and past the detector, they tend to be kind of centered a little bit more across species and times. Uh, maybe that's interesting, maybe that's uh, well known, I don't know. But on the right, the table is the most important part of this for me as a statistician, <laughs> and perhaps those making uh, decisions based on data, is this new detector, GRS, uh, detected a ton of fish. Um, the 81,000 uh, Chinook, 65,000 Steelhead, and 10,000 Sockeye in 2020. Um, that was from three or four to 11 times more day, more fish than were detected on the usual, you know, the, the GRJ bypass detector that's been in, in operation for years. So the amount of new data produced by this detector in its inaugural year was uh, really fantastic. Some of the information we get from now having two detection systems at Laura Granite, we can look at travel time from the spillway to Little Goose versus the bypass at Granite to Little Goose. And what we saw in 2020 was that during April, the travel times for fish going through both bypasses at the two dams, uh, that travel time was definitely longer than it was for the fish that went through the spillway. However, in May and June, the, those uh, travel times became very similar, and uh, actually, every, every, all the fish got faster. One of the most important uh, quantities we want to estimate using this new data is the detection efficiency of this new detector. Um, if, if most of the fish are going to, in the future, be going through this kind of a system, we'd like to be able to use the data from that system to estimate um, 
how efficient it actually was. The left side graph is our, our results of estimates called manly par efficiency. And basically, you're of the three rows of detectors in GRS, to estimate the efficiency of a, one of the rows, you use the data from the other two rows. And then you do that for each of them. And then you put that together, and you get a composite for the overall group, kind of at a pulling yourself up by your bootstraps estimate. And so that estimate was in the 92, 93% for both Chinook and Steelhead. We're not sure that that doesn't have some violations of some assumptions. Uh, we aren't sure, but let's call that the most, the best case scenario. On the right is another method that uses uh, three different passage model and uh, another uh, estimation, uh, P hat estimation model, and it puts that all together and indirectly estimates the detection efficiency of GRS. And it showed more like 50, 60 for Chinook and 70, 80 for Steelhead, which is much lower. However, we're also unsure of, it's not so much assumptions that go into the, that, those models, but the data that go in and whether they're relevant to this situation and especially in 2020. Um, so consider that a worst case scenario and that probably the actual efficiency is, is somewhere in between. We hope near you know, 90% or something would be great. We, when we do the live fish um, releases, we can actually directly estimate this and hopefully uh, determine which of these methods will be better going forward. The, I, I want to get, just get back to the issues about the tons of data that we have with this new detector. Um, for our NOAA study, uh, fish tag in Idaho that I described, as well as all wild Chinook and all wild steelhead, that's the three groups we have here, um, we can look at their survival to granite, the, the variability of that estimate, and then the detection efficiency at granite and see how those change by either including the new data or excluding the new data. And what we see is, uh, one, the release to lower granite dam survival estimates are similar whether you use the GRS data or not. And that's really good. We want to know that adding a bunch of data, we don't change the, you know, the accuracy of our data, of our estimates. Uh, the standard errors of those estimates were reduced a lot, like one to five times smaller, which is great. That's you want more precision, and that's as a result, uh, and that results from this detection rate at granite that's much higher, three to five times for these groups. Um, went from about a 10% detection rate if you only use GRJ to 30 to 45% if you add in the GRS information. So it's more data, better estimates. And then I want to finish with the prime example of the, of the benefit of this. And that was uh, due, to, due to a couple of factors. The 2020 uh, hatchery sockeye cohort that's about 50,000 fish pit tagged in Idaho um, annually, um, we were able to look at, look at survival from um, release to granite for those groups. And we have we see the same pattern that the release in the in the top graph there that survival, the release to lower granite survival estimates were similar through all the groups and especially in the total. The standard errors of those estimates were actually reduced from four to sixteen times, a huge benefit in precision. And then the detection rate at granite was over twelve times higher. That the, the detection efficiency estimates we're over 12 times higher when you include this new data. Uh, we, if without it, we would have had detection efficiency estimates at granite for sockeye was from like two to 5%, which is very poor and would be really making, playing havoc with our assumptions in the, the survival model. So this, this data was timely, we needed it, and it's really exciting to see how this will continue going forward and the kinds of things that we'll be able to look at uh, and the survival and other estimates we'll be able to make to uh, help management in the basin. And that's all I have. That's
Uh, any questions? Well, thank you very much, Ben. That was another great talk. And so nice to see it following Gabriel's talk. So we're going to have first a few, I'm going to ask people to direct questions to Ben first. And I think we'll have still have time to, if you have thought of something for Gabriel or something you want to throw at both of them. But let's first start with specific questions for Ben. And you could either raise your hand or use the chat. See a hand raised. Um, Marika. Hey, Ben. It's good to, to see that the survival estimates were really close with and without the GRS. That was, I think, a question on a lot of people's minds um, going into this first year of data collection. Um, from the 2020 data, do, do you know how many, um, at least a guess of uh, what proportion of tags um, were detected on the GRS and not at any other um, juvenile detections in the snake in Columbia? Uh, I don't have that number on the tip of my tongue, but I will say that I'm pretty sure that the, the number of detections on GRS was as many or more, for very depending on what group you're talking about, than the entire rest of the basin from Granite to Goose, Lomo, Ice Harbor, McNary, John Day, and Bonneville, all pooled together. So um, there were a lot of fish that were only seen on this detector. And that is really important, uh, the information that we have. Uh, there's many, many things I could have said. Um, the examples, I'm sorry, that I could have used of benefits, uh, some of them being like the, the range of passage dates for fish. I mean, if you only are getting 2% of the fish, you might not see anywhere near the actual range of passage for untagged fish, for example, simply because you have so little data. And so, yes, this, there was many, many more fish detected here than anywhere else. and and many of these fish weren't detected anywhere else. Okay, yeah, I was just curious because um, a lot of SARs are, are based on pit tag detections alone that are not expanded. So we know it, that based on pit tags of returning adults that there are some adults that were never detected as juveniles. So how much is this GRS going to um, let us know in, kind of realize that maybe our SARs might have differences now that we have the GRS detections. Yeah, what, the one thing this GRS detector does, of course, is it identifies fish that pass fill at at least one dam um, instead of going through a bypass system to be detected. And it is a very controversial topic. Um, to get into, you know, uh, bypass selectivity or not, spillway selectivity or not. But um, having a whole lot of the fish, a whole big proportion of the fish that are passing through a non-powerhouse route be now identified. Um, it, yeah, um, when SAR information comes from these fish, it, it could be very illuminating or it may uh, tell us nothing new. We, we just don't know and, and we're, we're two or three years out from knowing that sort of information. But some of us are waiting with bated breath for that. Thanks for the good question there. And if you um, have forgotten what SAR is, it's small to adult return, or perhaps you're Multi not you're from outside the Columbia. That's not as common. <laughs> I'll throw that out there. I see a question yeah, in the chat. Oh, sorry. I was going to move on. Is that OK, Ben? Another question? Yeah, I was just going to say that small to adult return from some place to some place. So you have to identify where the smolt is defined at and then where the adult was detected at. And then between them is the smolt adult return. Yeah. Correct. Right. Thank you. But, so Rich Townsend's asking, uh, if this all goes well, will there be any other dams getting similar spillway arrays? Yeah. Um, I, certainly I'll defer this to Gabriel to answer uh, if he actually knows anything more. <laughs> but to my knowledge, there's nothing in place to do it right now. I'm sure that there will be the call for such 
detectors. Whether that's being developed or not, I personally don't know anything. So uh, currently, I have not heard of any other spillway that's getting this. We have worked uh, on a, a group, and we've looked at the ice and trash sluiceway at Bonneville. Um, there are a couple of fixed gates that are wide open on the Oregon side. Um, and we've looked at, at using the technology that we developed for the spillway system uh, to put detectors in those two gates. And then a couple of the movable gates would use the standard in-stream detectors. So um, I would like to see this go into other places. I mean, I think we've certainly proven the technology works really well. Um, but currently, I haven't heard talk of this being used in another uh, spill bay. All right, I'm going to keep an eye on. Mark, I see your hand raised. You want to unmute yourself? Go ahead. Yeah, um, good job. Uh, since I don't work in the Columbia Basin, I'm not uh, real familiar with what you guys are doing with salmon, but I'm just kind of curious with putting out one to two million tags a year and your return rates, maybe it says more about <laughs> survival, which is probably really low, but but um, I'm just curious why, because you, I assume those fish are tagged when they're small, so they're going out. Does it not seem like you're missing a lot of fish? Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, the number of tags you put out and then the low returns and then, and then the numbers that you're getting to calculate survival estimates and stuff. I mean, those things are really small numbers uh, when you're putting that many tags out there. Maybe I just don't understand it. Uh, sorry if I'm stupid about it, but I'm just curious. No, no you bring up a, a very important question. And um, that again is you know highly debate debated uh, on on various levels, but w from the information that we see, um, sometimes there is a, a large component of these fish that don't survive down to the first dam. Uh, then there's other groups that survive poorly or well through the dam system, and then of course there's a, the ocean where they uh, live or die and that takes and of course a huge component and then even the and then the mi migration back upstream to their uh, to either any of the dams or to their where they were tagged or to their natal uh, spawning grounds um, there's there's components of survival where fish are dying you know, all the way along it uh, and they all contribute and it's always a a debate as to you know which what's happening in what areas and and what's most to blame and all those kinds of things what's really nice about the kind of information we're getting now uh while sometimes they're small numbers but is all these uh, different detection systems especially the in-stream arrays that they're just everywhere and so we can start to you know put into little compartments survival and timing and uh, passage uh, you know, we can get information on much smaller scales to start to tease apart, you know, what's happening to fish and where. And just as a data analyst, you know, to me, I just enjoy generating the data and the and the, the and applying models to the data to get estimates. But I know that the folks who manage fish, these new systems have to be you know, just a a great boon to them um, to because of the, the new information that's out there due to the work that Gabriel and others have done. And I just want to add one point of clarification, Mark, and maybe I, I, I probably didn't explain this that well. When I say we, um, that it, it's BPA funded projects that could range anywhere from looking at, you know, a researcher looking at restoration in the John Day to up on the Wenatchee River. So if it's, if some component of that uh, project is funded by BPA and they get tags uh, from BPA, or even if it's a researcher for uh, WDFNW that is doing their own research, if they want to utilize uh, the Patagas database, then they can upload their tagging files. So that's not one, those 2 million tags, it's not one uh, project that's that's doing a release. That could be you know, numerous, I mean, it is numerous studies throughout the Columbia River Basin that is utilizing the Patagas database and all of the detection records in it for their project. 
Okay, good question. And I see, uh, thanks Marika for adding some details into the chat. So I switch to another question. This is for Ben and all Ryan folks, you know, feel free questions for either Gabriel or Ben at this point. Uh, question from Ken Fecho. Ben, you showed a travel time graph that compared bypass and the travel time varied greatly during a few weeks and then tracked well before and after those. Are there thoughts on any on why that would be? Is this perhaps flow related? That's a very good question. Um, I think uh, early on in the season, if I'm remembering correctly, I, I could have included a graph that showed spill per percentage or and flow volume. And those things are changing through through the season. And and I do know that um, earlier on, there was much higher uh, amount of proportion of the of the river being spilled because uh, and then uh, I don't know if people have heard about that, that apparently the powerhouse wasn't being utilized as much as it might normally be in a spring season because of COVID shutting everything down. So electricity use was lowered. I mean, there's, there's some issues that we don't even know about. But the fact is, is that a large, larger percentage of the fish and the water were going through this, the whole spill way, including the, this RSW. Um, Er, and that was a higher proportion earlier than later. And of course, if there's more flow going a certain way, then you'd expect, I, I suppose you'd expect travel times to be shorter for the fish are going through the, with faster water. Um, later in the season, and it was more equally spread and perhaps the, whatever is helping them get from granite to goose um, was more equal. Um, the other factor I do know too is that um, fish are developing through time and they start to travel faster and faster as their urge to migrate and get to the ocean is stronger and stronger. So that's a factor in here as well. Some of that uh, chart um, had to do, there's smaller sample sizes on the back end too, which always has to be factored in. Hope Thanks, that answers ben. the question. Any other questions? Questions for either Gabriel or Ben? Raise your hand and speak yourself, or you could type it in the chat. Sam asks, can an in-stream cord antenna system detect direction of fish? Um, not a single uh, detector, but the, the cord antennas uh, the Weenus Creek example had three antennas in a row, and uh, that absolutely you can get uh, direction. And if you spread them out, you can get um, you know speed as well. So with multiple antennas, multiple cord antennas, you can uh, get direction. And that's true of any antenna, any in-stream antenna. Seeing a lot of thanks in the chat <laughs> to you guys. Everyone's really appreciating the presentations and the discussion here. Anybody else? Might be winding down on this Thursday afternoon. Going once, going twice. I am going to pass it back to Marika. Don't drop off quite yet. Okay. I, All right. I think okay. we're ready, Marika. Um, thank you, everybody, and um, for participating today. And thank you to the speakers for being able to present some very interesting, really good talks today. So. Uh, that was a great webinar for folks. Um, so this um, slide that you're seeing now, we have one more talk in this webinar series. That'll be next Thursday from 1 to 2.30 Pacific time. And Ryan Kinzer from N Nez Perce Tribe and Dan Isaac from uh, US Forest Service Research will be um, presenting. So please check that out. Um, we will also have a February, February series. So the schedule for all of these upcoming talks is on the EPIS um, page um, in um, TNAMP's website. So um, please check them out there. Amy just put a link to that in the comments box. Also, PNAMP has monthly newsletters, so if you would like to um, receive those, um, please contact Sam, or Sam might drop a link as well into the comments page um, to get those 
that information to you. It provides a lot of good information. Um, I don't see Sam dropping the link in there, but um, just shoot him an email. He can get you the link. So um, that concludes our webinar series for today. Um, I would also like to briefly um, give a shout out to the Fish Monitoring Work Group. Um, we will be having a meeting on February 11th for the group, so um, please uh, check that out. We hope to continue to add additional future ETIS talks uh, related to fish monitoring, so uh, this group will be kind of driving the, the wheel on uh, con coming up with interesting topics that um, folks are, are wanting to talk about as well as a uh, kickoff to the collaborative cross-agency discussions and or product related to past PNAMP workshops or other common problems. So some examples of what the, um, has come as a product of this is the uh, smolt out migrant analysis, um, looking at bias and also the smolt analytics if you participated in that last year. So we would like your input um, for the fish monitoring work group. So those of you who are interested in being involved, there is a short survey link that Amy put into the chat box again. So please follow the link. That survey will help us um, get an idea of what folks are hoping to discuss some I and throw around some ideas that um, we can discuss. Um, further developing in the future. So with that, thank you folks. Thank you everybody for coming and um, check out next week's webinar. Thanks very much. It was great. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Gabe and Gabriel and Ben. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having us.